I think they're going to remember this for the rest of their life. I had a lot of fun. I made some new friends. One, two, three. Big Hog Air Force! All right. Hi, everybody. Thanks so much for joining me. My name is Sam Hyman, and look who we have here, the owner of the NBA Chicago Bulls and the MLB Chicago White Sox. It is Mr. Jerry Reinsdorf. Mr. Reinsdorf, thank you so much for joining me today. It's a pleasure to be with you. I first want to start by saying, on behalf of Baseball Miracles, we want to thank you for, for all your support, your support for our founder, John Timidia. It, it means the world. Well, Baseball Miracles is a wonderful organization doing so many good things. And John Taminia is truly a great man. So it's, it's, it's a pleasure to help in any way I can. Well, let's start right there with uh, the Baseball Miracles founder, John Taminia. You have a, a long relationship with him. Can you share with everybody when your relationship with Mr. Taminia started? You know, it, I, it's been so long ago, I really don't remember. He, he joined the White Sox many years ago as a, as a scout. And, uh, you know, he's been with us, I don't know, it's a long time. And he's a wonderful scout. He's had very good results. And, I, and as far as baseball uh, miracles is concerned, I know this is just, you know, this is just a wonderful thing that he's doing, out of, you know, out of love for the game and love for the people that he's, that he's helping. Yeah, Baseball Miracles, nonprofit organization that serves impoverished youth across the world, baseball, softball. When you, when you hear about what the organization does, how much potential does an organization like Baseball Miracles have to continue to grow? Well, you, you know, you, you, can't, you can't measure it. I mean, it, it, but there's no reason why it should not continue to grow and grow and grow. And, uh, you know, the, the results are hard to measure at any one time. But if you're doing the right thing, and, and Baseball Miracles is, it, it, the end results are going to be wonderful. Do you have a, a favorite John Taminia story over the years? Uh, I don't know if I have one. You know, we have this sort of a com uh, ridership uh, you know, a connection because of Brooklyn. Because, uh, you know, I come from Brooklyn, grew up in Brooklyn. He, 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 he was a Brooklynite for some portion of his life. We talk about Brooklyn a lot. Uh, but, I, you know, I, I don't have one, but one particular story. It's just that he's, you know, the best story is how good he is at what he does. Yeah, no doubt. And and to, to start an organization like Baseball Miracles, which is about eight years in, and uh, do, do you do you recall the, the first conversation that you had with him about Baseball Miracles? I, I know that he loves to talk to a lot of uh, the supporters frequently about it. Yeah. So do you remember when he first told you about it? You know, sure. I, 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 again, I don't remember the precise conversation, but I remember when, you know, he did, he did tell me about it. I, I thought it was a great idea, but I also thought it was an ambitious undertaking for him. And I wasn't so sure that he'd be able to be that successful with it. Well, this Zoom thing isn't exactly where it should be. There Let's we see. go. Yeah. Okay. I'm, I'm, I'm very low tech. This is, <laughs> this is a super high tech for me. To your days as a kid, obviously the mission of Baseball Miracles is to serve the impoverished youth and giving everybody an opportunity. What, uh, what do you remember most about the, the Brooklyn area, the opportunities that you had, and, and maybe how much has changed from your hometown, the Flatbush area, compared to when you were a kid? Well, you know, first of all, I, I didn't get a baseball glove until I think I was 9 or 10 years old because my parents couldn't afford to buy one. I think this thing's gonna fall again. My my parents couldn't afford to buy one, and my my, my uncle Alan Proto got me my first glove. Uh, you know, it, it was uh, we had very few places to actually play baseball. Uh, in Brooklyn, we mostly played in the streets, so that was stickball that we played. But there, but there were there were certain areas where you could go to play. You know, on a baseball diamond, and uh, they were not kept up very well. Uh, they they did lots of. Uh, Lots of bouncing around, you know, a lot of rocks in the infield, that sort of thing. Uh, I, I play as a teenager uh, in the police athletic league. Uh, I think I think it was a sixty seventh precinct in Brooklyn, and they they gave us the uniforms and uh, and went out to a place called the parade grounds or another place called Wingate Field and you know, played there. 
So, Mr. Reinsdorf, with the, the mission of Baseball Miracles being to serve uh, children at a very young age, what would be your message to some of the, the children out there that maybe don't have all the necessities at a young age right now, especially during this time? Well, I, I, I don't, the message I have for them is to you know, learn to play baseball, have fun. Uh, you know, it's a great way to interact with your friends. Don't take it too seriously. It's not, it's, 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 it's not life or death, but enjoy it. It's a great diversion. And, uh, you know, enjoy yourself and, and, and go as far as your skills take you. Speaking of your upbringing, obviously from Brooklyn, and you were very close to Ebbets Field, and had the opportunity to be in the stands when Jackie Robinson broke the color barrier in 1947. What do you remember about that day from your perspective? All right, well, for, first of all, it was, you know, everybody thinks that the first day Jackie Robinson played for the Dodgers was April the 15th, but actually it was a couple of days earlier, uh, but it was a preseason game. During the 1947 spring training, Branch Rickey, kept Robinson on the Montreal roster. That was a triple-A team. But just before the season started, the Dodgers and Yankees always would play a home-and-home -home series against each other. And it was in that Yankees series that Robinson first wore a Dodger uniform, and I was there. It was a preseason game. Uh, you know, I was 11 years old. I don't think I, I fully appreciated the, uh, uh, the significance of it because in, in Brooklyn, I had a lot of black friends. I mean, there wasn't anything odd about it. Uh, I, I know the, the main thing we were thinking about was, was this guy going to be any good? In 1946, the year before, the Dodgers actually tied for the pennant with the Cardinals. First time there had been a tie. And they lost. The Cardinals won the playoff, and then they won the World Series. So in, in 1947, the Dodgers had two rookies that were coming up. One was a, a first baseman named Jackie Robinson, and the other was a third baseman named Spider Jorgensen. And all we ever talked about was, are these guys going to be good enough to get us past the Cardinals? Uh, you know, at 11 years old and in a place like Brooklyn, you didn't really realize what the significance of it was. And it, the, the first time that I actually realized it was when I asked my friend Lester Davis, who was black, uh, who's your favorite player? And he looked at me like I was nuts. And he said, well, Jackie Robinson, of course. And that's when I realized that Jackie was the only black player. Wow. That's uh, how often do you, reflect on a on on days like that i mean that must have been just you, you, like you said you realized that the the moment was was even bigger probably obviously years down the road yeah it was as i got older that i realized the significance of it i mean and robinson was a god robinson was a great player he's the most exciting player that i ever heard but as i got older i obviously realized the significance i don't recall that there was any kind of an electricity in the air at that game that oh you know this uh, here comes this black guy uh, I, I, I don't I don't recall that at all. Uh, and, and I don't recall it being that big a deal in Brooklyn. I really don't. Maybe it was around baseball. But, you know, Brooklyn was Brooklyn. Brooklyn, Brooklyn was the, first, the, 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 the best place for something like this to happen because we had people of, you know, all religions, all races. Uh, but as years went by and I read more and more about what happened, particularly books written by Robinson, then I came to realize how difficult it was for him and the significance. You alluded to it, but the diversity that you experienced growing up with people from all kinds of backgrounds, race, religion, in Brooklyn, as a kid experiencing that, how much is that obviously you know, translated over to you right now in the role that you have as an owner for two professional teams to have conversations of, about the importance of diversity amongst your, your front offices? Well, you know, as a kid growing up, I mean, uh, you know, I learned that the color of a person's skin is not any more important than the color of his hair. Uh, and, you know, I, 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 it wasn't something that I suddenly learned. It was just, you know, that's, that's how I grew up. We, 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 we grew up with uh, uh, a very tolerant area, with, with, as I say, with mixed religions, mixed races, that sort of thing. And so, I, you know, I've always led my life. Uh, are you a good guy or a bad guy? Doesn't matter what color your skin is. Right, absolutely. And with a movement recently, obviously, for, for social justice and, and everything, an organization like Baseball Miracles, we look for 
kids from all different types of backgrounds and give them an opportunity. Uh, so at, at the highest level where, where you're at, what types of conversations uh, have you been having the last several months in, in terms well, of diversity? Well, well, diversity is not something you know new for us. I mean, at the White Sox and at the Bulls, we have a tremendous amount of uh, programs for inner city kids. But one of the ones I'm most proud of is, is something called ACES, stands for Amateur City Elite. Uh, the White Sox sponsor it, and, and we provide uniforms and, and, and educational support for kids from the eighth grade through high school. And uh, we've been doing it about nine years, ten years. And we've had uh, we've had a handful of players drafted. We had one player drafted in the first round this year, one a couple of years ago. But the important thing is that over 200 of the players who have come through our program have gotten four-year scholarships to, uh, to college. And, and so, you know, it's, it's a great program. And we, we have so many programs for the, for the inner city. You just can't do enough. The, the, the job is too big. You just you, you can't do enough, but we keep trying. That's, that's incredible. And for, for those that uh, want to learn more about that program, what, what can you say initiated it? What, what, was the, what, was the, what were the conversations like to, to get that going, to get the ball rolling with that? Well, that particular program wasn't wasn't our first. I mean, we've always had we've always been active in the community. We have, I mean, I, I can't even count the number of programs that we have. We work very closely with the University of Chicago Crime Laboratory and uh, trying to sponsor jobs for people. I'm, you know, we have a whole book that I, that outlines what we do. It's just when we when we when I first got into the game, I realized that you know that we're a business that draws a lot of support from the community, and we owe the community to give back to them. And so we've always been active in, you know, all sorts of programs. And, and most of them are programs, you know, for poor kids and minority kids. I mean, we don't need any programs for rich kids. Right. Yeah. No, that's, that's, an, uh, that's really awesome to hear. Yeah. Mr. Reinsdorf, if you could share one piece of advice that you have learned throughout your journey in sports, what would that be? Well, the one thing I discovered in sports, and this wouldn't be advice, but the, the, the sports is the ultimate meritocracy. Uh, people succeed based upon, upon their ability not, but not, and, and, and results, not on whether people like them. Uh, you know, but my, my advice to everybody young that I, that I come across is to be honest. Work, work hard and be honest. And when you give your word to somebody, you have to keep it no matter what. And, uh, and in playing the game, just give it your all. Give it your all. And, 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 and don't complain when you don't win because when you don't win, somebody else is winning. And then you're not necessarily entitled to win. Just, just enjoy, enjoy playing the game. And enjoy the camaraderie of the people on your team, the people that you're around. Certainly. Absolutely. And, and while, while we're on the subject, I mean, do, do you have one specific memory as a kid playing the game of baseball? Does, does one ring a bell? When I was actually playing? Yes. Yeah. It, it, I don't know why I remember this, but I was pitching. I, I've never gotten over this. I was pitching uh, to a fellow named Bernie Gorelkin. I must have been 16 years old. Bernie Gorelkin could not hit any pitch above the waist. I mean, I, I got him out over and over and over again every time we played his team. And this one time, a pitch got away from me. And it came in at the knees, and he must have hit it 800 feet. And and for the last 60 or 70 years, I guess it's at least 70 years, maybe a little longer. I I I I keep reliving that. Why didn't I get that pitch up? Why didn't I get that pitch up? Wow, that is. You know, but but the, you know, but that ball players are like that. I mean, I I uh, uh, had a conversation once with the, with Moose Scourin, who worked for the White Sox after he got out of baseball, and he told me that uh, he once went 0 for 40, got a hit off of Joe Black, and then he went 0 for 20. So he had one hit 61 times up. And so the next time I saw Joe Black, who was a pretty good friend of mine, I, said, I started laughing. I said, Moose Gowron only got one hit 61 at bats, and he got that hit off of you. And he said, yeah, he hit a high fastball. They, ne they never forget. And this is probably 50 years after the <laughs> Moose got the hit. These right. ball players, they never forget. I, Jim Tomey can probably tell you every home run he hit off of, every pitcher he hit one off of. These guys, they never forget. That high fastball. <laughs> Joe, yeah, Joe said it was a high fastball. Wow. 
Well, uh, Mr. Reinsdorf, we, we really appreciate your time again. I know there's, su there's such uh, unprecedented times that we're dealing with right now. So I hope that, that everything is, is well on your end. I'm sure you've been very much dealing with a lot of things you, you didn't anticipate that you'd ever deal with, right? I never anticipated a, a pandemic, that's for sure. Uh, but, you know, this country has come through lots of things over the last 250 years. And, you know, we'll come through it. We just got to, you know, keep our heads straight and keep, you know, com uh, working through it. And it's unfortunate that the pandemic is also mixed in with, you know, with the rioting that we're having. And, uh, you know, I, 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 it, 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 we, we, I just regret the fact that thugs have, have uh, infiltrated some of the good movements and I hope I hope I hope that, that they're not the, you know they're not hurting the good cause uh, you know, people should be mar you know marching in peaceful protest making their, their their views heard and then but but then when these thugs come along people think they're part of you know that they're, they're the same as the peaceful guys and, and and then it hurts that really hurts so it's, it's really important to keep the thugs out of our movements Certainly. And I'll just uh, give you give you the floor to finish here with any any final thoughts uh, for John and, and for the Baseball Miracles mission as far as what the future holds. Any 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 wise words? Well, as far as the mission holds, just keep on little by little, you know, getting it bigger and bigger. Don't get don't grow too fast. You know, uh, I, 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 I don't take things on that you can't deliver on. That's really what I'm saying. But, but but to try to you know, grow as much as you can. Of course, you know I know John's gone through some tough times now, and I, you know, I'm really concerned about him. And uh, he just has to be Brooklyn tough, and he'll get through it. Brooklyn tough. That is yeah. uh, that's a great way to put it. Well, Mr. Reinsdorf, thank you so much for your time, and uh, all the best to to you and your family and everyone that that you interact with on a on a regular basis. I know you're a busy man, so thank you, and thank you so much for, for your support to Baseball Miracles. It's been my pleasure. Just keep, do, keep doing what you're doing.